Okay, uh, welcome everyone. Um, very excited to introduce you to this session, um, Strange Weather, the Uncertain Science of Prediction. Um, on this session, uh, I'm going to be uh, wearing two hats. I'm going to be giving a short presentation and also helping facilitate conversation. Um, on the, the panel with me, we've got Jeff Mulgan, uh, Chief Executive of Nesta, and uh, Carlo Buontempo uh, from the Met Office. So I'm going to give uh, a background and some, an overview of the interests behind this session and why we're exploring this uh, at the Future Everything Summit. Um, and uh, it leads nicely into the next session, uh, Designing the Future. The reason we're looking at, at th this topic here is that um, uh, Future Everything's engaged in a project called Euporias that's all about um, a new generation of climate services uh, it's about seasonal to decadal forecasting, which we'll tell you a little bit more about. And one of the key issues we're grappling with there is uncertainty, how we handle uncertainty, how we communicate uncertainty. Uh, this image here is, uh, is Sandy, uh, Hurricane Sandy that hit New York uh, uh, recently, um, had a devastating impact uh, on the city. Um, and um, you might ask, well, where would we look to for predictions of this? Well, um, predictions come in many places. Uh, some of those images are certainly reminiscent of fiction. Uh, we're used to disaster uh, imagery from fiction. But actually, the, the science of prediction in this context is uh, it's, a, it's a world of mathematics, very big data, um, supercomputers, um, and it's a complex space. Um, Understanding uncertainty is one of the great scientific challenges of our time. Um, it's, uh, it's a theme that's uh, been explored and highlighted in many, different, many disciplines, in many different ways. It has many different senses in different places. This is from economics, a famous quote from Frank Knight, you cannot be certain about uncertainty. Um, and there's a real issue here. Because we, it arises differently in different places, about how we communicate, how we speak about uncertainty. Um, in a very direct sense, if, say, we're visualizing uncertainty, there's both the um, uncertainty of the visualization itself, but then also we want to communicate to people the level of that uncertainty. You know, how, how certain are we in the data? So, so these days, when communicating data, um, you don't just need to communicate the data, but you also need to find another dimension. How do you communicate the uncertainty, which raises a number of, of real challenges? But then there's also the cultural issues around here. Um, uh, prediction in a, in a scientific context means something very, very different from uh, a political or an investment context. These have really big implications, the, 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 the place in which these, these things occur. I'll give you one illustration of that. So in 2009, um, there's a famous uh, incident with the Met Office um, when the, the press reported that it would be uh, a, the barbecue summer. 2009 was going to be glorious sunshine, fantastic summer. Um, the actual forecast at the time was that there was a 40% chance of Britain getting higher than average rainfall, i.e. its odds on in everyday speak, that it will be sunny. This is actually a quote from a radio interview from a senior forecaster at the Met Office. Uh, good hot spells and perhaps getting the odd barbecue out. Now that got translated as it moved from the world of the Met Office and big data and science. As it got translated into the media, that became the barbecue summer. And of course we all know what happened. It rained, okay? Now, what's interesting there is not that they got it wrong, because actually, what does that mean to get it wrong? They were right, the forecast was right. There was a 40% chance of higher than average rainfall. It was that transition. It was that transition from a scientific register when the level of uncertainty is, is understood, it's contextualized, translated into the media, which works in terms of sound bites. And that's a painful illustration about how uncertainty migrates in very difficult ways into different places. <coughs> so there's a real challenge here about how we communicate uncertainty. 
And that's the focus in a project called Euporias. So Euporias is a project led by the Met Office, led by Carlo. Uh, Future Everything's delighted to be a small cog in the wheel. And it's looking at the growth of a new uh, industry sector of climate services. And these are companies that take um, forecast data and they uh, develop that and present it for certain industries. So they present targeted forecasts or various, various levels of service around the data to make that useful, to make it usable. It's specifically focusing at seasonal to decadal forecasting. So that's not a few days. It's not the weather forecast. It's not 100 years. It's not climate change. It's uh, several seasons to a few decades. And that happens to be, it's quite a broad, broad spectrum, but critical for many things. Critical for building levees in New York City, for investing in tourism, uh, for planting a forest. Absolutely vital for, for huge areas. And the real challenge there is, is this notion of uncertainty. So if I'm a, a, a politician or I'm developing a business, um, how do I handle this 40% uh, chance of higher than average uh, rainfall? What does that mean? How do I translate that into a business context, into a policy context, when I'm answerable to my stockholders uh, or to vo voters? And it's that transition that at the moment is preventing that information from being used. And Euporias wants to explore how to get beyond that. I'll just very quickly step to one side and give you uh, a little background about how we came to be working with the Met Office. Uh, Future Everything, between 2006 and 2009, did a project called Environment 2.0. And we were looking at participatory methods of generating data on climate and environment and also making sense of that data. And we work with uh, Carlo here, as you can see, um, developing a number of projects. There was a, a big exhibition, um, big conference, but also a number of prototypes where we devised these experiments. They so were design experiments and engaging the public in generating uh, data that the Met Office couldn't capture in any other way. Um, climate bubbles was one. We created these kits. People were running around playing bubble games, and that created uh, a data set that produced some learnings uh, for the Met Office and for us. So now with Euporias, um, an interesting thing for us, in a sense, I'm standing here uh, in front of you announcing what's us for us is a, is a brand new interest. Um, not yet worked out, out. At the moment, we've got a problem, and we're bringing a set of methods to explore that. And over the next three or four years, we're to be developing some projects that will really probe and test this. So in, uh, in, in, in January, uh, we had the kickoff meeting in Rome uh, that brought together the stakeholders and the partners. And where Future Everything can contribute is in a number of ways. So what we can do is we can bring approaches from design and from art and apply them in this space. So on the one hand, we do a lot of work around innovation. So we can work with uh, designers and businesses in developing prototype uh, climate services and enabling that innovation to happen. We can look at data visualization to make that data more accessible, more understandable. And then a key interest for us is actually how we can embed artists into the process of the development of these prototype climate services. And what that, that's about is that, um, in a sense, art here is about inhabiting uncertainty. Um, science deals with uncertainty in one way, business in another, and art can bring a really rich way of engaging in that. In science, we might try and overlay different models to try and minimize uncertainty. Sometimes that just produces other layers of uncertainty. Other certain, it pushes the uncertainty into other places. In decision-making, in business, um, the kind of dominant paradigm is a, is a rationalist paradigm, what certainly has been for a long time. Um, if you think of, of business thinking and business planning, this idea that we can rationally plan uh, uh, for contingencies. And what we see now, actually, probably the closest parallel to these kind of questions might be in finance, for example. And in finance and in the markets, we've seen that the markets, 
which, like insurance, is one place where uncertainty arises and is, is dealt with, things are anything but rational. Um, you look at sort of how the markets are evolving now with sort of algorithmic trading, etc. They're any, anything but rational. So there's some very big social, cultural questions around here. Um, in a sense, it's not just making the... Well, it's, it's not about making the predictions more accurate. It's about communicating that uncertainty and really changing our, our frame of reference. It's about learning to live with uncertainty um, so that those predictions can become useful. Now, what we're going to do today is we're going to hear two, pre two presentations, one from Carlo at the, at the Met Office and one from Jeff, both of whom are looking at this question of prediction, forecasting, foresight and uncertainty from very different di directions. And we're going to have a discussion to try and pull out some of those uh, common themes across those two. So if I can first hand over to Carlo. Thank you. Thank you very much, Drew. It's, uh, as usual, a pleasure to be here, uh, Future Everything. I've been here another time a few years back for, for the bubble, and uh, it's really a vibrant atmosphere that you can feel here. So it's a privilege to be here. Thank you for having me. So um, as you can probably spot from my accent, I'm not British, despite representing the, the Met Office here. And so often I, I'm asked what brought me to, my, to this country. And uh, people are surprised to hear that it has been the weather, really. <laughs> and I'm happy to be here today. I was a bit worried yesterday because of the snow, um, the prediction of snow. And yesterday when I went to bed, it wasn't snowing at all. So I so, said, well, I have to talk about uncertainty. This is not a good start. And then it started this morning, as expected. So these are just a um, few slides I put together on the train. And they are more of um, general, you know, just images to, to trigger a bit uh, the discussion. Well, I pompously called on uncertainty. So I want to start from a simple concept, so sort of high school teaching about uncertainty. And I want to start from observation. I think there is somehow often a misconception that reality is just, you know, you can measure reality and that's it. And actually there's a huge uncertainty about measuring reality. Um, making a measurement means that you have a value and you have an error bar. And this error bar is part, part of this error bar is just fluctuation and part of it typically is a systematic error, a, a bias. And actually I'm arguing, so I know this is, has been called the heads down generation because everyone is tweeting or using the tablet or the mobile phone. So before you do that, I just wanna give you my you know, take home message that uncertainty is as important as the signal. So it's not something that we should discount, say, you know, how to reduce uncertainty, or maybe we can do with a better word like certainty. Well, I, what I'm arguing here is that actually uncertainty is very important and is as important as the signal itself. Um, this is an example coming from a completely different field, so sort of particle physics, and you are comparing different measurement in this case of the, I think it's the, the mass of the top quark. And the only way you can really compare this measurement is by looking at how the different measurement and their error bar overlap with one another. And this is very important. In, uh, in a sense, a few years back, uh, trying to measure the, the mass of the neutrino, um, which is a very, 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 very small mass, actually, in a sense, was more important the error bar than the value itself. So the error bar was excluding zero as a possible value, which meant that the neutrino probably had mass. Um, but actually... Um, I probably, I cannot give a talk without mentioning this initiative, so here I am. Um, there is a lot of uncertainty even about the past weather, let alone the forecast, I so will get there in a minute. This is an initiative uh, that some colleagues of mine put together, and it's called Old Weather. It's about reconstructing the weather of the past. And this is done by digitizing uh, the logbook of ships. You know, there is a, a, a huge archive of logbooks, ship going from uh, the UK down to Australia, to the colonies, to... Um, Jamaica and so on. And this information always contains also weather information. And this can be used in models to reconstruct what has been the weather of the past. And there is uncertainty. We don't know exactly what the weather was like on you know, 29th of January 1848. But we can have an, a, a guess, an educated guess. Um, well, if you move out of the measurement and you go into prediction, which is a bit the topic of the discussion today, then you get into a completely different universe. So I'm arguing here that actually uncertainty in the prediction is a, a, somehow a different sort of uncertainty. It's still a measurement of our 
uncertainty, uh, our level of confidence about future outcomes, but it's somehow of a different nature. And I started somehow picking up what you were saying about the overlap of different kind of prediction with a prediction from the Bank of England, I believe, um, of inflation. So uncertainty um, is part of all sorts of prediction and not only weather prediction. And actually, in many, in, many, in many ways, if you look at climate projections, actually the uncertainty associated with climate projection often is small when compared to other sources of uncertainty in decision-making processes. Um, but, ah, oh, that's a pity. Well, anyway, <coughs> there is an equation down there. Um, this is a, a classic image of the strange attractor of the Lorentz model. So this is a simplified model, very simplified model of the atmosphere, if you want. Um, and what you see here is one quite typical characteristic of every complex system, which is the sensitivity to initial condition. So you can imagine that you start your trajectory on this strange system in a specific location, let's say the one you see there on the top left. And, and that circle can represent your uncertainty in, in your initial position. And as you can see, in certain situations, that uncertainty remains you know, relatively confined around a sort of a circle-like shape. But in certain other position, actually, you start diverging. So very small variation from where you are here can lead to very different um, outcomes, which is basically the case of the weather prediction. So just um, a way we can use that um, sensitivity or tackle that problem and by using, it's through the use of ensembles. So the idea is that you have an uncertainty around the initial condition of your forecast, and you run your model forward from that initial condition, and you see what are the possible outcomes, right? This has been the way um, weather prediction have been uh, dealing with uh, this sort of uncertainty. And probably an example you're familiar with is tropical cyclones. You know, uh, Drew was mentioning Cyclone Sandy that he's hit um, New York a few, years, few months back. And this is a good example of how ensemble prediction actually have improved significantly our ability of dealing with uncertain um, weather. Because the landfall position and timing was very accurately predicted. And similar was the case for um, Katrina uh, a few years back. And this makes a huge improvement in our ability of predicting um, the weather. So if you look back at the beginning of the century, there was this um, cyclone that struck um, the city of Galveston in Texas, and the entire city was flooded and devastated and basically disappeared from the maps, just because that cyclone wasn't predicted at all. So there's been a massive improvement in, in our ability of predicting um, these things. But s sticking with this idea of exploring the uncertainty in the initial condition, then you, you, know, you basically can end up with a, a number of possible evolution of the atmosphere. So each one of these maps represents a possible future, given the initial condition we have today. Which means that in certain conditions, these are two examples from the European Centre for Medium Range Weather Forecast um, for the City of London in the mid-90s. There are certain conditions where actually the prediction is quite stable. It's one of these positions you know, on the initial attractor where the shape doesn't change much with time. So you can have a relatively uh, small uncertainty for quite a while. There are other situations where actually you cannot say much, even just uh, three or four days down the line. Well, probably many of you are aware of the famous you know, 1987 uh, storm and, and, Mike, uh, and Michael Fish. Um, Michael Fish just took a, a very risk approach, saying you know, there is no uh, cyclone hitting the UK tonight. Um, are we in a better position now? I would, I would say yes, we are. And we are because we can explore the uncertainty associated with that prediction. So should we go back to 1987 and, and redo the same uh, exercise? Probably today we would say, while it's not the most probable outcome, it is possible that a big storm will develop overnight and hit um, the, you know, the, the south of England and create a lot of disruption. And given that it's possible and it's quite, well, relatively likely, um, then maybe we want to do something. So the, the, the response would be completely different from what was the response at that time. Um, well, it's difficult to talk about uncertainty uh, in, uh, in a short period of time because of different sources of uncertainty. But if you, from weather prediction, you move uh, on longer timescales, so if you start talking about 
climate change time scale, then you start introducing a completely different source of uncertainty, which is the uncertainty about our future economy, society, and response. So these are the representative concentration pathways, so the emission scenarios, if you want. Um, and these basically represent different storyline of what the world may look like. So the RCP 8.5 represents a situation where actually we are not very good in switching into a low carbon economy. And because of that, we keep emitting very, very importantly throughout the century, uh, increasing the overall burden of greenhouse gases. And this results in an increase of uh, the radiative effect and so on in the impact of climate change may have. But there are different potential storylines. So there are storylines where we actually reach a global agreement relatively soon and we start declining our um, intensity of fossil fuel economy. And we don't know really which one of these uh, storylines we are on at this stage. So what I'm saying here is that there are, these are completely different sources of uncertainty with respect to what I was telling you before. And there is a, a third, as, as a minimum, a third source of uncertainty, which is the uncertainty in our ability to describe the world around us uh, in a numerical model. So these are just, uh, just a simple example for what is expected in terms of precipitation, rainfall, over West Africa. So this is a re area where actually rain, um, agriculture is mainly rain-fed, so actually precipitation is very important. And what you have with different colors there are different models. So they're all climate models, they're all good quality climate models. They have just been developed by different people, so they have you know, different characteristics. The equations are not exactly the same. The way that the, the equations are discretized are different. And because of that, you have a huge diversity. So, you, you, you know, the, the, the top one and, and, the, and the bottom one, in many respects, are the two best models reproducing present-day climate, ability, climate uh, variability. But for the future, they predict a completely different outcome. And it, this, again, is a different source of uncertainty. It's uncertainty about our ability of model the world around us uh, through a numerical model. Um, and why, why is that important? Well, I'm, at Met Office, I'm leading uh, a team, a climate adaptation team, and our work is mainly to somehow start that sort of process of bridging the gap between users and producers of climate information. So try to really to make the climate information useful to decision makers. So this is just an example for the electricity network where we are trying to assess what is the risk that climate change poses on the electricity network in the UK. And at assessing the uncertainty associated with our prediction is very important. Well, this is just um, another example. In this case, actually, looking at how different the situation at present. So you see the, 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 the top one is the number of days um, a certain temperature threshold is exceeded at present. So 1971, 2000 climatology. And uh, what you see on the bottom are three possible outcomes for the period 2030s, 2060s. Um, of that same parameter. And why is this important? Well, because this parameter actually happened to be very important for railways, for the, the trucks. Should you exceed that parameter very often, you will start, you will start seeing uh, truck buckling and, and disruption to services. So there is, a, there is basically a decision to be made there. Should we invest in infrastructure now? How much does it cost? Is it uh, reasonable or not? Um, well, similar... similar um, plot for a number of different variables associated with lightning and snow and, and gale. And, you know, it's not always a, a bad news. At times, the, the, um, at, at present, we, we do not expect the risk to change significantly. That's, for instance, the case of wind. For other variables, such as snow, actually, we expect the, the well, it's not the right day to say, but we expect the, the risk to go down, while um, probably lightning m might go up. Um, and this is the, um, probably um, a big revolution in many respects. So we, we have described now two of the main predictions we make at the Met Office. On one side, the weather prediction, and on, the other, on the other, the climate projections. And I'm using here two different words because they are two different things somehow. On one side, the prediction, starting from the initial condition and going forward. And on the other, the projection, where actually predictability comes from our ability of model you know, how the uh, emissions will affect the climate. But there is something in between, and what um, is very much what Drew was uh, alluding to, which is this uh, seasonal and decadal time scale. So now we are in a position of making skillful predictions for the next six months, for the next years, and so on. Well, up to five years, we have skill 
in certain variables. Um, and this is the example of um, 2010. Probably you, you probably remember 2010 as being a very cold um, winter or late uh, autumn, uh, early winter. Um, what you see on the top right is uh, the plot of the anomaly of temperature for that month with respect to climatology, and the fact that the entire UK is blue means that is well below average for that period. And if you look at the prediction, well, unfortunately, probably I, I chose the wrong aspect ratio for my slides, but if you look at the prediction, I can promise that the one on the left uh, says below average chances. And you see it's 45 percent, 30 percent near average and 25 percent above average, which goes back to the point that Drew was making. Um, was this prediction right? Was this prediction wrong? I think we, we have to somehow to go beyond that paradigm and start thinking, was it useful? Can, has it triggered any action? And in this case, it did trigger the action. Um, and one of the reasons um, it triggered the action is because we worked closely with the, the, the people who were using this prediction, which in this case was the cabinet office. Um, so what you see here, well, a lot of diagrams, uh, quite rich in information, but is the product that has been developed through a collaboration between us and the Cabinet Office, defining what was the best way of visualizing information. So what you see down there, for instance, is the, the difference between the distribution, the probability distribution of um, normal year, of the average year, if you want, and what is the probability distribution of our prediction. So this is actually, you can go on the website and, and, and look at it. It's, it's live now. And as you can see, for this March, the prediction was slightly skewed toward colder value, meaning that colder than average were probably more likely, while for the period March to May, so you can be reassured, it seems to be not too far from normal. Um, getting into, um, into this uh, last uh, couple of slides, this is uh, about the project um, Drew was mentioning. So there is a, a big movement uh, internationally basically through the WMO, the World Meteorological Organization. So this is the organization that is behind the IPCC, for instance. They launched a new initiative, a global initiative that is called the Global Framework for Climate Services. And one of the main goals of this initiative is really to try to bridge what the Americans call the valley of death, a bit um, strong words, but um, which is the distance between the producers and the users of climate information. So it has been recognized that you know, just providing information out there is not enough. You need to do something to be sure that um, that gap is, is, is bridged. Um, and the European Commission recognized this effort and put a very significant funding toward the development of the next generation of climate services. So there are three projects funded by the European Commission. Uh, one is SPECS, which will improve the seasonal prediction and the cable prediction. One is uh, NACLIM, which basically will make better observational data sets, mainly of the North Atlantic, Ocean. And the third one is Euporius. If you want to know more, you can visit the website. Um, but basically, this is a consortium of 25 partners across Europe um, aiming to develop, in the course of four years, few working prototypes of climate services. So the idea is not to generate yet another portal of climate information, but try to really identify few strong cases, case studies, and develop for those case studies a working prototype going all the way through from the climate, produce, climate information producers to the decision makers and tailoring the information to their needs. So this is just a, a bunch of the partners in the organization, but more importantly, there is um, a very big uh, stakeholder board. So uh, the meeting we were talking about before has been the first meeting of the stakeholder board, and um, we are talking about already 60 organizations or, or thereabout across Europe. And we are working closely with them to identify these uh, case studies. Um, and the final, final, final part, um, touching really on, on, on the edge between science and art in many respects, is the visualization. How do we visualize uncertain information? These are work, I'm sorry that uh, the, the caption of, of the paper is, is not there, um, but it's a, it's a work that um, um, Rachel Lowe has done on how to represent seasonal information going from a scheme where there were only a few categories. So this will be near average condition, below average condition, above average condition, and you end up with this patchy image that is not very informative. And again, working collaboration with the users of this information, they identify a qu quite different scale that is, allows you to see how far from the, the ignorance that will be the middle point you are in any specific condition. Um, this is another example. Uh, this actually was done for uh, WWF, 
trying to understand how far the ecosystem were moving due to climate change. And in this case, we used the, the size of the white dot as a measure of our ignorance. So we are sort of hiding the color according to how uh, big the uncertainty was in, in that specific region. Um, and finally, I think these methods that are now been uh, sort of accepted by IPCC and will, is likely to play a major role in the next assessment report. Um, and in this case, actually, we are trying to put two information together. On one side, the intensity of climate change, which is given by the color, and on the other side, the level of uncertainty, which is given by the intensity of the color, if you want. So in, in this region, we really don't know much what's going to happen, while in this region, we are fairly confident there will be a decrease in precipitation. And I can leave it there. Thank you very much. Okay, well, good afternoon. Carlo is a genuine uh, expert. I'm a jack of all trades. Uh, and I'm going to talk a bit about um, prediction, but also about fighting against prediction uh, and really the, so the dialectics of this uh, topic. Um, and in a way, asking all of you to reflect on what, what things are you certain about? If you look 20, 30 years into the future, what things would you actually sort of stake your life, your savings on? I would predict with fair certainty there will be a pope in 20 years' time, and he might be someone to invite to a future version of this panel since he has a particular take on certainty. Uh, now, where do I point this? <laughs> no, nothing's working. Uh, yeah. uh, okay. Um, what I want to talk about is a little bit so what, what we can know, and then I'm going to talk a bit about what we can't know so well. And some of the background for me is, is uh, over quite a lot of years, I've worked with people who aspire to understand the future. Uh, at one point, I, I oversaw a network of futurists in all the departments of the British government. I worked on futures things in Europe, in China, uh, Singapore, uh, using all of these sort of tools. And if you're interested, in fact, next month, uh, Nesta, we're publishing quite a few analyses of quantitative tools, sci-fi and so on, in, in helping to understand the future. All of that, though, has left me pretty doubtful that there is any such thing as an expert on the future, and that certainly includes me, uh, and by the time I finish, you'll agree with me, I hope, at least uh, on, on that. These are tools, and they are tools which are related to action, which don't stand usually outside of action, and they are very contingent tools. At first glance, though, it looks very different. We, just in the last few years, have had our lives, in a way, invaded by algorithms, making predictions in daily life. Wonga uh, works economically, even if it doesn't work morally, because it has very good ways of predicting creditworthiness of clients, better ones than the banks. Um, in, if you go into a GP, you may have this thing used for you, which is an algorithm for working out whether you're likely to go to hospital in the next year or two. And many fields, like crime and health, have these sort of diagrams analyzing risk factors and patterns in ways they, they simply weren't able to do uh, 10 years ago. Many of you will have heard of uh, Google Flu, which aspired to forecast flu trends from looking at how many times people Googled flu. The interesting thing with that, as with all the others, is it worked really well until something unpredicted came along, in that case swine flu last year, and then it didn't work very well at all. Uh, and all of these tools turn out to have their limits, as we found with financial tools in the Great Crash. This is just one chart really to reinforce what Carlo said. This is weather forecasting improvements since the 80s to today, showing how much better they have become, at least in forecasting up to three, five, seven days, but not perhaps quite so good two weeks out or a month out, as, as, as he said. Um, oops. And we have, I think, this extra oh dear. Um, extraordinary proliferation now of um, sort of beautiful visualizations. You can just get me back to, uh, to that slide, which are trying to go beyond the kind of linear algorithms to mapping complexity of thought, to mapping uncertainty of trends, networks of issues, networks of uh, people involved in trends, and so on. Um, the problem with those is they're very beautiful, but they're quite hard to act on. 
So I'm just going to quickly run through a few things which I think have to be part of our mental picture of the future, but also why they're tricky. So probably the most striking sort of facts of our time are all of these J curves. This is, the, if, this is sort of 1750 here, the present here. And if you map GDP, if you map carbon emissions, if you map water use, if you map uh, almost anything, it appears as a J shape. Now, what does everyone know, if you've studied engineering or physics, about J-shaped curves? The prediction, of course, is they can't carry on going up. They have to reach a limit and become an S. So one sort of dimension of any thought about the future is the question, when will these hit a limit? When will they, uh, they, they stop because they can't go on forever? And yet then we have this other J-curve, which is the IT J-curve, Moore's Law, uh, relentlessly going forward, and as Ray Kurzweil says, we're, half, we're probably only halfway through the exponential J-curve. How will those interact? Will digital technologies save us from the J-curves of carbon, water, etc., etc.? Nobody knows. It's essentially a matter of taste, whether you're an apocalyptic, gloomster, or, or an optimist on this. I think there's equal problems. You look at other things. So in, it, this, this is a chart which you can't read, really, just forecasting economies size up to 2050. And all the forecasts show China becoming the biggest economy. There's America. There's the Europe. And here's India, Russia, and so on. Probably right. Uh, and Nesta, we've done variants of that for R&D spend, which shows quite dramatic shifts of where research will be done globally with China by 2030, the biggest spender on R&D, India a major player, Russia too. But then you look at what people in panels like this said 45 years ago, which country was then the most guaranteed to be a major technological industrial power? Who remembers? Iran. <laughs> guaranteed under the dynamic modernizing leadership of the Shah. Uh, every futurist then, if you read the books, forecast Iran would by now be you know, a, a major world power, bigger economy than France and Germany. So caution with all of these things. Then demography. Demography looks like a really reliable set of trends. So we published a thing a couple of weeks ago with a title five hours a day because life expectancy is going up five hours a day. It's true. Every 24 hours, your life expectancy by some measures has gone up five hours. And in some countries, it's actually going up one day a day, which is an extraordinary achievement. But you can really misread that because, in fact, the outer limit of life expectancy doesn't seem to be going up at all. More people are getting to the outer limit, but the outer limit, contrary to what Ray Kurzweil claims, interestingly, doesn't seem to be shifting at all. And then there are the things which appear to be reversing. How do you make sense of those? Are we in a dramatic period of insourcing as personalized manufacturing, 3D, etc., moves manufacturing back into the West or not? Are we seeing a dramatic reversal on politics? Long-term trends of disengagement, distrust is what's happening in Iceland. This is the Finnish open ministry here. All of these tools trying to engage the public in democracy in new ways using digital technologies. Will they turn the trends around or not? No one can know. And in a way, what all of this points to is how we should doubt. I think there's a lot of forecasting which is predictably wrong. The most interesting thing is what came from the book by Philip Tetlock on expert political judgment, where he showed the more famous the guru, the more likely they are to be wrong. And it's because there's a loop. They have to feed silly forecasts to the media to get coverage, and then they, have to, then they find themselves making their forecasts sillier. And it's very clearly proven. There's tech determinism is always wrong. Anyone who thinks technologies rain out onto society and you can forecast them in a linear way always gets the future wrong. And interestingly, futurology is about the, parts of it at least, the least changing part of human intellectual life. A few months ago, I was on a panel with the man who is the Google's top-rated uh, futurologist, whose name I won't mention because you can test this. In his most recent book, his futurology forecasts exactly the same as the world's top futurologist in the early 1970s. A whole series of forecasts about the labor market, about jobs, about robots, about automation, which were made 50 years ago and were wrong. And he hasn't even noticed. So there's a, there's a sort of a, 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 a real sort of question of this field, and it's, in some ways it's laziness. And another version of futurology I can't uh, uh, ignore this week after the budget is the futurology of British chancellors, who always say that the economy will have turned around in three years' time. 
And every year they say that, so at least they're consistent, uh, even if consistently wrong. Now, wh what this drives me to is, I think, I was going to mention three questions which I hope we can, we can address. One is whether we predict the things which really matter. And clearly the weather does matter a lot, but a lot of prediction doesn't really focus on the things that matter. Um, and a lot of the things which really matter to our lives are about our minds, our mindfulness, the world we live in, in in interior terms, and the quality of relationships, connections, people around us, which appear to be exactly the things you can't forecast. The other reason I should say why I've put this slide up is there is quite interesting scientific evidence that if you put a brain in a presentation, your audience is 25% more likely to believe what you say. So this is an absolutely shameless attempt to win you round on a Friday afternoon. Um, but in a way, the, the deeper issue is that a lot of what's raining out in terms of technology and so on is cluttering our minds, is fighting against well-being, fighting against uh, mindfulness, is in some ways our weapons of distraction which aren't helping us. And a lot of the forecasting of stuff is actually in part the enemy of what makes life good. Here's a little chart of what Europeans say is important for them. Top ones, love, health, friendship, peace. So one of the questions perhaps Carlo can answer later, you know, how do we forecast these things, these things that really matter? This may sound really impossible, but one of the things which I've been involved in the last year or so is, is launching this thing called Action for Happiness, uh, which now has 131 countries uh, as members of it. What this actually contains is actions you can take in your own life which are highly likely to make you happier, scientifically proven and with references to follow up. So even these fields which appear as far away from physics as you could imagine, in fact, are becoming somewhat more predictable. And a whole series of cynical journalists have been sent to sort of test these things out for a week, and without exception have come around convinced, oh my God, maybe I could actually make my life predictably better. So um, two, two, two more minutes. One on, on, on what we should do, and I'm going to go over this very, very quickly. For me, some of the most interesting projects I see and involved in are ones which, on the one hand, are trying to encourage greater capability to forecast, to predict, to model, often using technologies, but also then to fight against what they say. So one example is Uprising, which trains leaders, including now in Manchester and Salford from a few months ago, Often in running the campaigns, which you have to do to complete an uprising course, you have to map local data, see what's happening, and then use that as part of your argument, part of your arsenal, to stop that thing happening. We recently launched a program on digital making, helping teenagers in schools create programs, apps, games, and so on. And again, that's partly getting an understanding of the sort of dynamics Carlo was showing, but in order to change it, in order to see the digital world as malleable, something you can shape and change and not simply be a victim of. More radically, too, studio schools, which have their headquarters about half a mile from here, the fastest growing network of schools in the country, they do most of their curriculum through real-life practical projects working outside the school with pupils. And again, some of those projects involve things like measuring air quality in a town, doing forecasts of weather or of jobs and so on, but in order then to work out how do you shift those, how do you act on those trends, how do you turn them into uh, agency uh, rather than simply sitting in a classroom and learning uh, from others. And a third example of action is TIES, which is, uh, uses social media, social networks to surround vulnerable older people with a network of support, family, friends, doctors, and so on. They then share some of these predictive models of the risk factors of what might leave this nice lady to go to hospital, but in order then that collectively they can act to stop those things happening. And there are many other examples of that kind. So final minute about what we should do. For me, the most exciting questions of now are the ones which, by their nature, are not are the most unpredictable. And I, I've written about them a bit in this book, another shameless plug since it's out uh, this month, um, on uh, capitalism. And in a way, what that is saying is that many of the big systems around us are fundamentally broken. Finance is an obvious one which became designed essentially to extract money from you, not to provide a service to you, selling you, you know, credit card protection or default swaps 
uh, and so on. The same is true of food, a brilliant system for making everyone fat, but not a very good system for making everyone healthy now. Um, and uh, uh, I'll just jump over these. And, and, and health as well. All of these systems are in fundamental ways now pathologically broken, but it's impossible for anyone to predict where they should go because you need to actually change the very parameters of the model, which then you could be forecasting. Uh, and health is the most dramatic example because, as this chart shows, the more you spend on health at the moment, the more your people die. So I will jump over that and jump over systemic uh, I innovation, which is, for me, the, the really interesting field of the next 10 or 20 years. How do you align, in a sense, the micro-actions of creating new products and services and projects with understanding the dynamics of systems? And that is uh, incredibly challenging. Um, but in a way, what some of the models Carlo was talking about, which are thinking of the whole world as a system, help us then to apply much closer to home where there is this dialectic between the system and the actions we take. Thank you. I'm going to ask a few questions. Don't, we don't have very long. I'm going to ask a few questions up here, but I will take some uh, questions from the floor. And I just really want to get some conversation between two different um, perspectives and point of views on, on this question of forecasting. And there's one thing I'd like to knock down right away, and that is that the physical world can be forecasted, whereas the human world can't. Um, certainly from a design perspective, there's been a big move we discussed earlier to thinking about prototyping the future, to thinking about where we can find the seeds of the future today. Um, clearly, in, 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 in Carlo's world, it's very much about mapping long-term um, physical processes. And I'd like to think, well, actually, we're still talking about complex systems here. And, and a question I'd like to ask, it's, um, feel free to knock it down, but we, we see ever bigger models, ever more complex models, are we just not creating more things we don't know, more uncertainty? Is what we actually need more uh, epistemological modesty to acknowledge that in this fuzzy, complex world, actually there's far more we don't know than we do? Wow, what a question. <laughs> um, I mean, it's a, it's a very good question, and uh, as a most good question have a, a, a difficult answer, or probably not a single one. Um, there is always... Well, if you, if you look at the complexity of models, over the, I mean, I'm talking about, in this case, climate models and meteorological models, over the last um, two or three decades, actually the complexity has been increasing almost steadily. This, uh, on one side, has allowed us to capture some of these feedbacks in, in the mechanism, so some of this connection between the subcomponent that weren't captured before. But this doesn't mean that this is the only tool we have to understand um, reality and how, um, or improve our predictability, if you want. I think there is a big role to play for relatively simple model, idealized model, trying to understand processes. And I think probably the, the, the key concept here is really the process. Um, so um, it came up a, a number of times today uh, in relation to, to prediction. I think the, uh, the, the best probably the best possible way of uh, understanding whether your prediction is a, a skillful prediction or whether it's likely to be broken. I mean, you made the example of Google flu. I think that's potentially a good example. It came up uh, even earlier in another panel discussion. Because in that case, you based your prediction on a correlation. So basically, you correlate the number of clicks with the, the, the flu. But there is no mechanism really connecting the two, apart from the correlation. So I think we need to go down and, and understand how the process works. And once we understand how the process works, then we can model the process. And this gives us more, um, you know, ability, a better ability to, um, well, make a overall I'm more confidence in the prediction if you want. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, go. On. Well, there's just two comments. First of all, on, on the physical world, in some ways, you know, the, the story of civilization is of uh, significantly greater knowledge and predictive power of the physical world. Astronomy, probably the leading science of that, at first without the causal understanding you described, which then required Newtonian, Einsteinian physics to get at least partially uh, there. And whatever you may think of modern medicine, which has had its, you know, its trials and tribulations, our knowledge of causation in the body is a lot greater than it was, dramatically greater than 50 years ago. But the more you know, the more hopefully you know that you don't know. 
The same applies in other fields. So if you take schooling and education, in fact, there's quite a lot of knowledge about what works on things like you know, helping kids to learn how to read or helping them with maths, but there's other fields where very little is known. In health, we know a lot about um, you know, how to prevent infection spreading, but surprisingly little on, uh, on public health. So I think in some ways one needs the humility of recognising the gaps uh, in knowledge, but to characterise today as an era of uncertainty is in some ways dramatically wrong. We have far more knowledge at our disposal. What's striking, though, is how many fields that knowledge is not well orchestrated. And let me just give one example. Smart cities being discussed in this room beforehand, which should be one of the fields of really serious evidence, data, testing, experimentation. It's a field where there's almost, I'll be dis I'm sure disagreed with by some, but there's been very, very little systematic orchestration of knowledge, testing of hypotheses, proving some and disproving of others, mainly because of the commercial interests involved. Whereas in the best areas of health, education, and crime, you know, hypotheses are tried out and tested. The knowledge may not then be eternal, uh, but at least it's, it's, it's a reasonable knowledge. And the, the paradox of a lot of stuff around data and technology is in some ways it's much less smart than other fields. Thank you. Uh, Carl, I think you have a question for Jeff? Well, I was just keen to go back to the point. You, you, open, you, you threw a question at me, so I, was, I think it was uh, just polite to go back to you. Um, so you were talking about predicting happiness or predicting mm. uh, other parameters. And I think there is... Um, well, I don't think we'll get in, into the, the business of predicting happiness. Not yet. I'm, I'm sure the, the chief executive at the Met Office doesn't have uh, on his uh, top plans. But I think there is, a, there is an important um, aspect of what you're saying that we should consider, which is the user. I mean, um, the, the, there's Cash, I think is the name, is an is a, um, American scientist, and he came up with this idea of the dock loading approach between science producer and science users. So from um, climate information producer, if you want. We reach the, the harbor and we leave our container of knowledge on the dock, mm. and then it's for the user to use. And this leads to misuse, misunderstanding, or poor products as, a, as, a, as an outcome. So understanding you know, this personal connection, understanding how the decision-making process works, understanding the social context is very useful. Just um, a very simple, simple example um, for West Africa again. And we were providing information about the amount of rainfall that was going to fall during the wet season. So as I said, agriculture there is mainly rain-fed. So having a prediction of uh, the amount of rainfall we thought was useful. Well, it turned out that it wasn't that useful because the most important parameters for the agriculture, for the farmers there, actually was the beginning and the start of the rainy season. So should I plant this, this crop or not? And having that knowledge allowed us in, in the course of the last uh, three, four years in a project funded by DFID called CSRP, allowed us to improve the model in a direction that was useful to decision makers. So now we are better in predicting the beginning of the rainy season. So it's, um, I think there is a big role to play on this interface. Uh, I'm afraid I'd agree with all of that. Uh, we, we host a, a network called the Alliance for Useful Evidence. And we put the word useful in because most generators of evidence don't think at all about users of evidence, and they generate vast tomes, you know, brilliant PhDs and so on, which never get used at all by the practitioners in the fields uh, which that is relevant to. And so really understanding the, so the social context of use, the cognitive frames of users, is absolutely crucial uh, and surprisingly rare. And if I just be allowed one comment on weather and happiness... The really surprising thing is it appears to have no effect whatsoever. Although we all imagine if we move somewhere sunny like California or southern Spain, we would be happy. The evidence is really clear. We wouldn't be. <laughs> Thank, thanks, Jeff. I, I'm going to open to the floor in just one minute. But seeing as you're deeply unfair to Carlo and asked him how he could uh, predict uh, happiness, uh, I'll, I'll ask you how, how we can prototype the weather. Uh, <laughs> we'll maybe follow that for after. We've got to wrap up, so I'm going to take just a couple of questions. Uh, one here, and I think we'll just take that one, if that's okay. Hi there. Um, it was a very interesting talk, and I just wanted to ask one, or make one point about how um, we cope with uncertainty. I think generally, the way we think, we always impose structure and narratives <coughs> when faced with uncertainty. And I was just wondering the sort of challenges, um, how, how are we going to put across ideas of uncertainty when our brains aren't really orientated to working in that way? 
Um, I know uh, there's, a, there's a quote I was going to, to use from um, Brian Masumi talking about Deleuze and Guattari, which is that uh, creative uncertainty is in fact the brain's chief product. So I'd, I'd, I'd maybe contest the, the premise of that a little bit, but I'll invite responses from the panel. Well, just, just two brief comments. I, I, I think Drew's right. I think human brains actually very well designed for ambiguity, uncertainty, unpredictability until they moved into industrial era lifestyles which claimed to promise a degree of predictability which had never existed before. And we almost need to relearn some of what I think are our intuitions. Uh, an interesting example of a project to do that was one actually in Manchester and some other parts of the UK a few years ago which taught 11-year-olds resilience, really taught the mental habits of coping with unexpected shocks and not allowing them to be destabilizing. There are quite well-proven methods for sort of learning the mental habits of resilience, which I think is exactly what we need in an uncertain uh, world. And uh, just on, on prototyping the weather, I mean, in a way, Biosphere 2 in Arizona was an attempt at that, which was originated by a British uh, a, a thinker, um, and uh, I suspect we will see um, many more places trying to create their own microclimates and through doing that perhaps another set of knowledges about the causal relationships between you know, water, air, heat, sun, etc. Fantastic, thank you. Just closing remarks from Carlo? Well, just uh, on, on this point about humans and uh, uncertainty, um, I think that the, the issue there is, is very much about the quantification of uncertainty. I, I tend to agree with both, both uh, Jeff and Andrew about the fact that our brain can deal with uncertainty. I think it's, it's not probably well designed to deal with the quantification of uncertainty. Um, and this is a challenge because we are now in, in a stage where we can start quantifying the uncertainty on certain uh, predictions. Um, on the other side, the business model, uh, insurance, um, and a number of other decision makers normally deal with uncertainty in a quanti in quantitative way. So understanding how the decision-making system works in this organization, in these decision-makers, actually is fundamental. And this is one of the things we want to do within uh, Euphorias. So I look forward to that project. Fantastic. So um, over the coming years, uh, certainly the next three or four, you'll be hearing more of Euporias, and we actually will be prototyping climate services, and uh, if uh, Future Everything has any to d anything to do with it, we'll be bringing some critical design, maybe some uh, design fictions to that process as well, and certainly some artists. So uh, lots more to, to watch uh, in this space. Um, and I think we've hopefully set us up nicely for the following debate as well on designing the future. Uh, if you join me in thanking our, our panelists for this session. Thank you. Thank you.